Okay, hello everyone. So today I want to talk about adjoint functors. Now, according to many category theorists, the idea of adjoint functors is the most important notion in category theory. It's certainly amazingly important and extremely interesting. I mean, basically, categories are the sort of basic way of referring to structures and functors are the basic way of relating structures. Now, many of the mathematical operations which we do, like for example, taking the product of things, uh, can be considered in terms of functors. And the idea of adjoint functors sort of relates to the idea of inversion. You see, a lot of times in mathematics, when we know how to do something, we want to know how to undo it, what's the inverse, and there's various reasons for this. It allows us to solve problems like finding the particular elements which make something happen. But more than that, when we understand the inverse of something, it gives us another kind of process which might look quite different. For example, dividing by two is in some ways quite different to multiplying by two. And so it's very nice once you understand um, about timesing by two, you then get this other kind of idea of dividing by two, which is also very important and somewhat different. And we get that idea through knowledge of inverses. Now, the basic idea of adjoint functors is that um, often when we have a functor, particularly the important ones which occur a lot in category theory, it may tend to have a left adjoint functor or a right adjoint functor. These are two kind of things which are both a bit like inverses. Okay, so um, adjoint functors are a fairly abstract matter. So in this introduction, I'm going to be a bit hand wavy, okay, but I'll say that finding, let's say, the left adjoint to a functor is akin to sort of trying to find its inverse. It's not exactly its inverse, but it's a kind of functor that goes the other way, which is in some sense close to being kind of inverse. And similarly, there may be a sort of right adjoint to a particular functor, which again is another thing which is close to an inverse, um, but it's defined a bit differently, okay? So this may seem hand wavy, but um, just to say something concrete, let me say that the idea of coproducts, diagonal functors, products and exponential functors, all of those things uh, are all just related to each other um, by this kind of adjoint functor relationship. Okay, so what adjoint functors really do for one is they allow you to go from one functor to another functor, something which is a bit like a inverse. And the nice thing about them is that they are defined um, sort of up to isomorphism. They are unique. So just like um, if I have a function which multiplies numbers by two, it has a unique inverse that divides numbers by two. Uh, in a similar way, um, the sort of left adjoint or the right adjoint of a given functor is uniquely defined. And the amazing thing is that we're not just talking about, you know, multiplying numbers or something like this. We're talking about these functors, which do amazing amounts of kind of conceptual work. Um, for example, think about the product functor. It defines how products work on objects. It defines how products work on arrows. It defines all of this stuff. And then we can kind of find its adjoint, which will give us another functor. Now, like I was saying before, uh, inverses often tend to look quite different to particular functions. And in a similar way, adjoint functors often tend to look really quite different to the functor which we started with. However, the adjoint of a functor often tends to stand on a similar kind of conceptual level, importance-wise, to, to the original functor. 
So what this basically means is it kind of gives category theorists a way to get the important ideas of category theory for free. I mean, um, very often in, in mathematics, to really find out what the important definitions are, the, the really important notions requires a tremendous amount of creativity and exploration. Um, but with this idea of adjoints, we can just take a functor and we can kind of almost mechanically say, well, you know, does it have a left adjoint? And if so, what is it? And very often that reveals another immensely important idea in mathematics. So understanding um, how to work out these adjoint functors basically allows us to hop from one important idea in category theory to another to see how they're all related together. It affords a tremendous amount of kind of compression of knowledge um, because, you know, it really helps us to understand how all these gizmos in category theory are related to each other. And more than that, I mean, it really seems to be um, something of a kind of higher level which organises so many concepts which we think about. Okay, so adjoint functors are really important. Now, um, in this video, I want to introduce them. Now, this is a challenge uh, for me because I want to make this as a video for beginners. Um, although, in all honesty, um, adjoint functors are a rather abstract kind of topic. And um, even though they're so kind of um, abundant in mathematics, it's an idea which has only really been appreciated within the last 50 years because it takes quite a lot of um, it takes quite a lot of thinking really to to kind of grasp the abstract matters involved in adjoint functors. Now saying that, um, don't be dismayed because there are definitely ways into this subject. Um, and so I've made a rather long video and rather than uh, an approach I often take, which is to sort of try and carefully tread a single path towards the concept of interest. In this video, I want to do a more of a kind of multi-thread approach towards uh, talking about what adjoint functors are, because there's so many ways to define them. There's so many equivalent definitions of adjoint functors. And also there's so many examples. So rather than um, sort of trying to work out the mathematical logic of a particular example all the way through, um, I in, instead intend to show you lots of paths into this concept so that you can pick the one which is most acceptable to you. Um, draw, I'll draw a very, very rough analogy, um, which is that I'd say in some sense, um, learning what adjoint functors are is similar to sort of learning what, let's say, cooperative relationships between organisms are. I mean, there are many different kinds of cooperative relationships and they emerge in many places. And there are many ways to define and discuss them. And so if you want to know what they are, um, you're better off looking at lots of different viewpoints and lots of different kinds of examples rather than, you know, getting a particular um, book on biology or psychology or game theory or whatever and just following through one particular trail of thought. OK, in a similar way, um, I think it's much better for us to look at lots of examples of adjunctions from different points of view and then we can kind of and then you can kind of choose one and learn about it more okay so i suppose the first thing i ought to do um is to give you a definition of adjoint functors now as i say there are many different definitions and they have sort of pluses and minuses the plus about this definition is that it's very short and it's very useful for computations. Um, the minus about it is that it's kind of pitched 
in a rather abstract language, in this language of natural transformations and isomorphisms and harmful tools, okay? So if you don't know what those are, you can watch my previous video about the Yoni Dilemma, where I go into these details. However, I would recommend, um, if this seems too alien to you, just skim past it and carry on with the video because um, I'm going to explain examples rather than sort of going into this definition really directly and unpacking it and explaining what all these abstract things mean. I'm going to show some simpler examples of this definition of adjoint functors at work and then I'm going to shift to a different viewpoint which is the idea of how to think about adjoint functors in terms of universal morphisms, initial and terminal morphisms, okay? And I think that second perspective is actually a lot more useful for really um, getting a handle on what adjoint functors are really all about. Um, but also throughout this video, there's so many examples. Um, and so, you know, just go through and don't worry and you know see the examples and then you'll be able to go back again and really try and absorb the definitions and then find the proofs and so on okay um so let's begin we begin with two categories c and d and we're going to suppose that there are functors between them there's a functor R from C to D, and there's a functor L from D to C. And what we're going to define is the condition for R to be the right adjoint to this functor L. Okay, so this symbol here means if and only if. So I'm saying that R is the right adjoint to L if and only if this statement in green holds. What does this statement say? It says that we have a isomorphism from the home set, the set of arrows from L of A to X to the home set of arrows from A to R of X. Okay, and also this isomorphism is natural in A and X. It's a natural isomorphism between home functors. So this statement may seem very cryptic if you're not used to these kind of ideas and don't worry about it because um, from now on, I'm going to kind of step down from this definition and then take another way into defining what adjoint functors are. I just thought that I should show you this and if you've watched the video on the Yo Needle Emma you should be capable of unpacking what this means, okay? Um, but what it really means, it kind of intuitively, is that there's a sort of correspondence between arrows in C, which go from L of A to X, and arrows in D, which go from A to R of X. So we have this kind of isomorphism between these two kind of arrows, these kind of arrows in C and these kind of arrows in D. And um, this is a kind of correspondence which has special properties. In particular, um, for any A and for any X, it puts the set of arrows from L of A to X into one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of arrows from A to R of X. And it does this um, in a way which has more features. It actually um, corresponds to a kind, it's not just an isomorphism between these kind of things, it's a natural isomorphism, um, which means that this um, kind of relationship has nice properties as we vary A and vary X. Um, Okay, so this is the sort of first definition of adjoint functors. And we often write um, L 
left turn style R. So it's like the L is the left adjoint to the functor R, or equivalently, the R is the right adjoint to the functor L. Okay, so okay, so when faced with a mathematical concept that's too abstract or too general to understand, one of the best things to often do is to kind of pick a specific case and reduce the level of generality. Often it's a good idea to do this almost as much as possible, really get down to the most basic examples of things, and then you can kind of work back up and make sure you understand. So in this case here of adjoint functors, this is certainly a very abstract kind of concept. And so I think it's a great idea to pick some really simple kinds of categories to understand this idea. So in particular, I think it's a good idea for us to think about pre-orders. So remember a pre-order is just a category where there's at most one arrow from one object to another object. So these are examples of pre-orders. And when there's an arrow from one object to another, for example, if there's an arrow here from zero to one in this pre-order, also known as a pre-ordered set, C, uh, we write zero less than or equal to one. Okay, so we use this less than or equal to sign to denote the existence of an arrow in a pre-order. So we can think about what this idea of L being the left adjoint to the functor R, or equivalently R being the right adjoint to the functor L, we can think about what this means for pre-orders. And this is a great place to start because pre-orders are simple enough that we can do lots of examples and we can really um, get a handle on um, what's going on. And also a lot of the complicated details in this definition of adjoint functors just kind of evaporates when we deal with the special case of pre-orders, okay? So the first thing to ask then is what is a functor from one pre-order to another pre-order? And such a functor has a very kind of simple definition. It's often called a monotonic function, okay, or a kind of order-preserving function. So a functor L from D to C, in this case from here to here, um, is just going to be for this case of pre-orders, it's just going to be a function from the set of objects of D to the set of objects of C, which is kind of order preserving or weakly monotonic, it's sometimes called. And that just means that this kind of condition holds that A is less than or equal to B if and only if L of A is less than or equal to L of B. So basically all we're saying is just that we're preserving the existence of arrows uh, when we do our functor, okay? So then here's an example of a functor from D to C. You see it's a functor which sends the objects of D to the objects of C and it's also basically corresponding to a kind of monotonic function from this set to this set which is kind of weakly preserving the order in which these elements come in where the order is kind of defined by this less than or equal to sign indicating the presence of arrows, okay? So then we can say, well, what about if there was another functor from C to D, a functor called R? And we can then ask, what would be the condition for R to be the right adjoint to this functor L, okay? What does this condition mean for pre-orders? And it turned out to be quite simple. It corresponds to something called a Galois connection. Okay, so say we have another functor, a functor which goes in the opposite direction. For example, this functor R, which goes from C to D, like so. When would this functor be considered to be the right adjoint to our functor L when we're dealing with pre-orders? Well, the key condition is this here, that L of A is less than or equal to X if and only if 
a is less than or equal to r of x. So this condition, when it holds for every a in d and every x in c, um, it means that this functor L is the left adjoint to this functor R. And you can see that it has a very similar form to this sort of general definition of adjoint functors. So this is what adjoint functors between pre-ordered sets look like. Okay, So can we see that these two kind of monotonic functions, these two functors going in different directions satisfy this condition? Okay, so how can we check then? How can we check that R really is the right adjoint to L? Well, we want to check that this condition holds, that L of A is less than or equal to X, if and only if A is less than or equal to R of X. And we want to check this, and we want to check this for every A in D and every X in C. So a kind of simple-minded thing to do is just to make a table like this. And we'll write down whether or not um, these inequalities hold um, for every one of these A's and X's. So for example, uh, here, uh, is it true that L of P is less than or equal to one? Well, here's L of P and here's one. And yes, zero is less than or equal to one in the sense that there's an arrow in this pre-order from zero to one, so that's true. Uh, how about the other condition? Uh, is P less than or equal to R of 1? Well, here's R of 1 and here's P, and yes, P is less than or equal to R of 1. So these are both true. On the other hand, it's not true that L of R is less than or equal to 0, but neither is it true that R is less than or equal to capital R of 0. So these are both false. So we see from making this table that this holds if and only if this holds for all of these a's and x's. So indeed, this proves that L is the left adjoint to R, or equivalently, R is the right adjoint to L. Okay, so if you're sort of combinatorically minded like I am, this type of um, idea um, should be very pleasant to you because it really gives you a path into the theory of adjoint functors and you can really start with these kind of finite constructions so um, a lot of the theory of adjoint functors is rather abstract when we're dealing with general categories as you can see by this definition here um, but at least for pre-ordered sets and totally ordered sets like this it's a lot simpler and there's really nothing to stop you from just um, starting out with the very smallest pre-ordered sets, you know, one element or two element sets and thinking about um, sort of systematically going through the different monotonic functions and tr making a kind of um, a kind of research for yourself about precisely when this kind of condition is true and uh, if that kind of thing appeals to you I, I really encourage you to do it because then you feel like you have more kind of ownership of the ideas if you discover them yourself perhaps you can discover what the kind of general conditions are for um, L to be the left adjoint to R perhaps you can find new kind of ideas that no mathematicians have ever found before to do with these kind of things I think there's so much space in mathematics for exploring the very most basic things and uh, I believe it's something that people probably don't do often enough. Okay, so here's a okay, so here's another example of one of so here's another example of adjoint functors between these pre-ordered sets, okay? This is quite a nice example. So we um we form this category here um, where the objects are integers. OK, so this uh, symbol Z here denotes the set of all integers, including the negative ones. OK, and we just form a preorder by connecting an integer A to an integer B when A is less than or equal to B. OK, so I've just drawn some of the arrows here. And um, there's another preorder that we can make. Um, which is just the same kind of idea, but using the real numbers. So not just the integers, but the other kind of 
numbers in between, okay? And there's some very interesting kinds of adjoint functors between these um, between these two pre-ordered sets. So what about if we take this functor here? This takes a number and multiplies it by three, okay? So that's a monotonic function. It preserves the order of the things it applied to. Um, so it corresponds to a functor from this pre-order to this pre-order. And we'll call this functor R, okay? And we can ask, what is the left adjoint to R? Now, in general, uh, a functor doesn't have to have a left adjoint, but in this case, this function does have a left adjoint, and it turns out to be this. Um, this takes an input, a real number, and it divides it by three, and then does the ceiling function on that. It um, rounds that number up to the, um, the integer, it rounds that number up to the kind of smallest integer that's greater than or equal to it, okay? Um, so how does this work, for example? Well, let's say we have 2.1, okay? So that's a real number. And if we do L on that, we get the ceiling function of 2.1 thirds. And so that's um, just a bit less than one. So the ceiling function rounds it up to one. So this gets sent to one under this function L here. And um, we can see from this that it's sort of looking like these might be adjoint functors to one another. I mean, um, what we really want is this condition to hold in order for L to be the left adjoint to R. We want to have that L of A is less than or equal to X if and only if A is less than or equal to R of X. Well, here's an example when we take A is 2.1 and then L of A is going to be 1, 1 is less than or equal to 2. And also we have that 2.1 is less than or equal to R of 2, which is 3 times 2, which is 6. OK, and I've done a couple of other examples here. So I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that. So I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that this kind of statement holds true for any A in this category and for any X in this category. And again, I think this is a nice example because it opens the door to lots of other examples where we have um, where we have these kind of numerical functions, um, these monotonic functions, and that we can think about what adjoint and we can think about what adjoint functors mean in that kind of context too. This is this kind of notion of Galois connections again, which is a sort of hint of the theory of adjunctions, which was discovered a lot earlier than the advent of category theory. So this kind of definition of when we have the L is the left adjoint to R is very useful when we're dealing with these pre-orders and functors between pre-orders. And remember that this originates from this kind of homfunctor based way of defining adjunctions that we started with. Um, but I think to really understand what adjunctions are in a more general context for general categories, um, there's another definition um, which I think is a lot more kind of informative of what's really going on because the way I think of adjunctions, it's sort of like if I know um, one of these functors, let's say I know L, um, then I can say, well, you know, maybe there's such a thing as the right adjoint to L. Maybe there's a functor in the other direction which um, satisfies this definition of an adjunction. And if there is such a thing, it's uniquely defined, at least up to isomorphism. And basically, we can think of this sort of right adjoint of a functor as being something that we can kind of construct given the left adjoint of a functor. Um, and I really like that kind of idea because with that kind of idea, one sees how we can sort of um, hop from one functor to another. You know, given a functor, maybe we can determine its left adjoint or its right adjoint, and that'll give us another functor, which means something different, and so on. 
Um, but the mechanics of how this works, to me, I think are kind of better illuminated by the, a different view of adjoint functors, which is using universal morphisms. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is uh, go through a definition of adjoint functors using universal morphisms. Now, this is going to seem a lot more long-winded, and unless you have some experience with universal properties and universal morphisms, uh, it might be a bit difficult to take in. So um, I encourage you in that case to watch my video on universal properties, where I define how universal morphisms work properly. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through this alternative way of defining adjoint functors for general categories. And then we're going to go back to this nice kind of case with the pre-orders and see how this new definition works for this specific example, which we've already gained some intuition about. So what am I saying in, in here? Well, I'm saying that we have an arbitrary category C and an arbitrary category D, and we have a functor L going from D to C and a functor R going from C to D. Now, I'm saying that a functor R is going to be the right adjoint to this functor L if and only if this statement in the green bubble holds true. So this symbol here means if and only if. It means the blue statement implies the green statement and the green statement implies the blue statement. So it's all about what this green, what this statement in this green bubble says. What does it say? Well, it says that for every object X in the category C, we have a terminal morphism from L to X, and it looks like this. So recall that a terminal morphism consists of an object in the kind of source category together with a arrow from where the object gets sent to under our functor in question, L, um, to this object X. So I'm calling this object R of X. Now, that's actually the image of X under this functor R, but let's not worry about that for the moment. Let's just try and recall what the definition of a terminal morphism is. So it consists of an object in this category D, which we're calling R of X, which has the property that if we do L on it, so we get this object here, L after R of X. Actually, I prefer to call that L after R of X. And there's also this arrow here, epsilon X, which goes from L after R of X to X. So that is this terminal morphism, which is a terminal morphism from L to X. Well, actually, it has the basic structure required to be a terminal morphism, but to actually be a terminal morphism, it has to satisfy uh, a special property, okay? Um, so what property does it have to specify? Well, for any similar kind of gubbins, so for any similar kind of object over here, which has an arrow from where it lands under L to X, there has to be this kind of unique intermediary arrow in this category D that if we lift it under this functor R, then it makes this diagram commute. Um, if you recall this from the definition of a terminal morphism um, from the video uh, category theory for the be for beginners universal properties okay so let's just recall what what that said it said that if there's another object a in this category d and it's such that there's an arrow from l of a to X, let's say an arrow K, 
I'll draw it in blue actually. Well then, there has to be a, a sort of unique intermediary arrow, um, some arrow H, which goes from this object A to this object R of X, which has the property that the image of that arrow, where it gets lifted under L here, makes this diagram commute. Okay, so here's going to be L of H, and it's going to be such that epsilon X after L of H equals K. All right, so and remember, according to the definition of a terminal morphism, um, we have to have that for any such A with this K thing, any kind of candidate, um, there's just exactly one arrow from A to R of X, which if we do L upon it, it makes this diagram commute, okay? So now we can start to understand a little bit about what this definition is saying, okay? At least up until this point. I haven't talked about the rest of it after here, um, but before this, what, it's, what this statement's basically saying is that there is a terminal morphism from, ev from this functor L to every object X in this category C. And the way I like to think of this kind of um, statement here is it's really telling us how to define this functor R, which is the right adjoint to this functor L. So we're sort of, the way I think of it at least, we're um, given this functor L which is this functor from D to C, and we, we're told that it has this special property that um, for every object in X, there's a terminal morphism from L to X. And this is starting to tell us, this sort of form of these terminal morphisms, is starting to tell us how to define this functor R, because it's telling us that um, we can, we're going to send x to one of these objects here involved in a terminal morphism from L to x, okay? Um, so, I mean, okay, there, there may be many terminal morphisms from L to x, but we know that they're all going to be isomorphic to each other. So this, you know, it doesn't uniquely specify how R is working on the object, but it's basically telling us how this functor R is working on the object because, um, you know, any two of these, um, any two of these kind of universal morphisms from L to X are going to be isomorphic to each other, just like um, any two categorical products of a pair of objects are going to be isomorphic to each other. So when we're defining this sort of functor, which um, which works, uh, which is when we were defining this kind of categorical product based functor, we didn't really have to worry too much about which of the categorical, which of the categorical products we were sending a given pair to. Um, you know, any one of them would be isomorphic to any other one if, if our category happened to have many of such things. Um, Anyway, that's all a bit tangential. Basically, so far, um, all I'm saying is that for every object X, there's a terminal morphism, um, which I'm writing like this, from L to X. And you can see that this is defining how this functor is, is working on objects, okay? So it's sending an object X to the first entry in this pair here, which, co which constitutes this terminal morphism from L to X. 
So we've sort of got now how this functor R is working on objects. Now the way I view the rest of this kind of statement is it's telling us then how this functor R is going to work on arrows. And it's actually um, really quite natural uh, when you get used to the idea. Um, so let's just go through this now. Okay, so what we're going to do is suppose we have some arbitrary arrow E, which goes from an object Y to an object X in this category C. And I'm going to describe to you how we're going to set up the way that this functor R lifts this arrow, what it sends this arrow to, okay? Um, so firstly, we have this terminal morphism from L to X, constituting this and this. And similarly, we have a terminal morphism from L to Y, because, you know, we have one for every object in C. So um, what's the, what does the one that goes to Y look like? Well, it's a object R of Y in this category D. And it's going to be a arrow from L after R of Y to Y. Okay, um, and this is also a terminal morphism, okay? Uh, this time going to Y. Now, this is the interesting bit. What about if we go along this arrow and then this arrow? Well, that will give us an arrow from L after R of Y to X. So let's draw that in. So this is the arrow E after Epsilon Y. And I'll call that K. Maybe you can think Y. Um, now then, here's the trick. What we do is we say, okay, I'm going to think of this object here paired with this arrow here as a kind of candidate for being a universal morph, being a terminal morphism from L to X. Okay, because it's an object here of D, um, which has the image of which under L has an arrow into X. So I can again use the definition of the terminal morphism. And what does that mean? Well, it means that there's going to be a unique arrow from this object here to this object here that if we lift it under L, it's going to make this triangle commute. Okay, so to spell it out, it means that there's going to be some unique H which has the property that which has the property that L of H makes this diagram commute in the sense that K is equal to epsilon X after L of H, or to sort of expand it out, what we've got is that E after epsilon Y, which is K, is equal to epsilon X after L of H, okay? So there's going to be this unique arrow here from R of X, from R of Y to R of X, which if we apply L to it, it makes this triangle commute, okay, in the sense that K is equal to epsilon X after L of H. In other words, E after epsilon Y is equal to epsilon X after epsilon H. That's exactly this statement here, okay? Um, and what do we do? Well, we just call this H R of E, okay? So all we're doing is we're actually setting up our functor so that it's going to send E to this kind of unique arrow that we know we have to have in D. 
um, because of E's presence and the fact that we know that we have a sort of terminal morphism from L to every object in C. So this is really very natural and it's basically just a generalization of the way that we defined arrows, the way that we defined how the categorical product functor lifted arrows. So that's done. That's the first definition um, of what adjoint functors are. Um, just to illustrate one extra thing, and then I'll talk about this. Um, I'll talk this over, but I just want to illustrate one extra thing while we're here. OK, so we're saying that we're actually defining R of E to equal H. So we've got an L of H over here, so we can just write this as L after R of E. And now, um, I mean, this is just notation, OK? But there's, there's something else I want to tell you um, just before we kind of step back and try and understand what this, you know, have another kind of pass at what this definition means. And it's an interesting fact, which is that epsilon here is actually a natural transformation. OK, so this epsilon here is going to be a natural transformation from L after R to the identity functor of this category C. So how can we see that? Well, what's going to be the X component of such a natural transformation? Well, it's going to go from L after R of X to X. And so it does. Um, and also for every arrow E of this category C, it would have to make this kind of square commute. And if you think about the square that it has to make commute, it's exactly this square here that we've drawn just delete the stuff in blue, you have exactly the diagram that shows you because, I mean, we know that we know that epsilon x after L of h equals e after epsilon y and we have h is equal to r of e. So that's exactly telling us that um, epsilon x after L after r of e equals e after epsilon y. So this exactly sort of uh, implies that we have um, that we have the epsilon here is a natural transformation. Now that stuff I've just said about the natural transformation at the end, um, you don't need to worry about that for understanding this definition, um, but it is that connection is going to allow us to write a much more succinct definition of what it means for a functor R to be the right adjoint to a functor L. So, I mean, in this definition, the reason I like it is because it's, it's sort of constructive, okay? It's basically telling you how to set up this functor R. Kind of given this functor L, which has this property that, you know, there's all these terminal morphisms um, to each of its object, um, from it to each of the objects in C, it basically tells us how to cook up this functor R. So I like that, but there's another way you can say an equivalent statement, and that is to sort of take this statement here, and rather than explaining how the how this functor R is set up to work on arrows. Instead, we just specify, we kind of spe actually state that um, this epsilon thing here is actually a natural transformation. So to get this kind of equivalent statement, 
we can just rub out all this stuff about defining the the way R works on the arrows. And here we just say instead that epsilon, which goes from L after R to the identity functor of C, this co-unit thing here is natural. And this is another equivalent way to say that this functor R is the right adjoint to this functor L, okay? Okay, so we have this new way of defining adjoint functors. And what we're gonna do now is return to this issue of these functors between these pre-ordered sets. And we're going to view it using this new kind of way of looking at adjoint functors. Now, previously we were using this kind of definition uh, for when L is the left adjoint to R which only works um, when we're dealing with pre-orders. Uh, and we remember that this was obtained from the hom functor definition we started with. But now we're going to use this kind of definition, which is a general definition of adjoint functors, um, equivalent to the thing that we started with involving the hom functors. And we're just going to apply this to this case of the pre-ordered sets, okay? So the way I want to think about this is that, let's say we know um, about L, okay? We know about this function here, which takes a real number, divides it by three and rounds it up, okay? And what we want to do is find the right adjoint of that functor, okay? Um, so suppose somehow we don't really know what the right adjoint is, um, but we do know somehow magically how to work out terminal morphisms from L to X, okay? Um, so how would we go about um, doing this? Well, the definition says that R is the right adjoint of L, if and only if, for every X in our left category. So our definition says that R is the right adjoint of L, if and only if, for every X in our category C, we have the R of X paired with this arrow epsilon X, which goes um, from LR of X to X is a terminal morphism from L to X. And also there's some other conditions we need on the arrows that I'll talk about later. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this first bit for a start. What we want is that for any object in X, so what we want is that for any object X in this category C, in this case, this is just our, category of integers with their ordering, okay? Um, we want there to be um, an object over here, which we're going to call R of X, which is the sort of object involved in this terminal morphism from L to X, okay? So how is this gonna work? So we already actually know what, what this object is over here. It's gonna be three times X, okay? So if we had a way to magically determine um, what this terminal morphism from L to X is, um, then we could find this. We could find that um, for a particular X, um, this object involved in this terminal morphism is going to be three times X. And that would define for us how this functor R works on these objects according to this definition, okay? Um, but let me just sort of prove to you that r of x equals three times x does satisfy this definition, okay? So we want r of x coupled with this arrow epsilon x to be a terminal morphism from L to x. So what does that mean? Well, that means that for any other kind of candidate, so a candidate would be something of a similar structure, 
an object over here which when we lift it under L um, we have another arrow into X and arrow K and if we do, do such a thing then according to the definition of a terminal morphism we ought to have an arrow over here that we can lift to make a kind of triangle so that we can re-express this K in terms of doing a composition of two other arrows. Okay, so let's see if this works. Let's pick an example, okay? So how about we pick this example of A equals X take away 5.1. Okay, that's a real number. And let's see if it is actually a candidate. So if we get L of A, that's going to be X take away 5.1 divided by 3, round it up to the nearest integer, okay? Um, is that going to be less than or equal to X? Yeah, it will be, right? So we're going to have this kind of arrow k here because remember in this category an arrow just means less than or equal okay so we will have this epsilon x because it's going to be true that for this integer x if we times it by three and then divide it by three we'll just get that integer then if we take the ceiling function we'll just get the integer so this will actually equal this so it'll be less than or equal to it so we can draw that epsilon x. And as I've just argued, for this candidate, x minus 5.1, when we do L on it, we'll get something less than x. So again, we can draw an arrow, okay? Um, so if this paired with this really is a terminal morphism, then we ought to have a intermediary arrow here that we can lift to complete this triangle, okay? so there ought to be this unique arrow which we can lift to complete this triangle. I mean, the uniqueness here is a bit vacuous because we're dealing with a pre-ordered set. There's always at most one arrow between a pair of objects anyway, but um, there is indeed an arrow here because in this category of real numbers, it's true that X minus 5.1 will be less than three times X. And if we do L on this arrow, it just gets lifted to a sort of less than or equal sign um, over here in this category of integers. So that'll be L of H. And indeed, this L of A here will be less than L after R of X, okay? So that's good. And this triangle will commute. Again, it's kind of vacuous because we're dealing with pre-ordered sets. Simply the fact that we have an arrow over here and an arrow over here means they have a composition like this, and this will be the only arrow because it's a pre-ordered set, okay? Um, so what we've done now is we've shown that for this particular candidate, uh, X minus 5.1, we do have this kind of property that we want to have um, for this paired with this to be a terminal morphism, that you know, basically there's a way to emulate how this candidate does its stuff uh, by using this intermediary arrow, okay? However, what we really want in order to really show that we have a terminal morphism here is we want to show that we can do this kind of emulation for any kind of candidate so we can then ask, well, what kind of A's could be good candidates? Um, and any A such that if we divide it by three and round it up to the nearest integer, it's um, less than or equal to X would be a good candidate. So what are the A's like that? Well, the A's like that are just the, well, the A's like that are just going to be the real numbers, which are less than or equal to three times X, okay? 
And clearly for any of those, it will be less than or equal to three times X. So we will have this intermediary arrow. We'll be able to lift it. We'll be able to complete it. So we've kind of convinced ourselves, hopefully, that the first part of this is indeed true, that R of X um, paired with this epsilon X um, does form a terminal morphism from L to X, okay? Um, so we've basically um, said now that R here um, is defined as a right adjoint, at least in the way it works on objects. The other thing we have to do is to understand how R works on arrows and check that it's working properly on arrows. Okay, so the next thing we have to do then is to show that this R functor here uh, acts like the right adjoint on the arrows. Now this is kind of easy in this case because we're dealing with pre-ordered sets. So a lot of the complications about identifying which arrows we need and so forth kind of evaporates. Um, but anyway, what we're going to do is read the rest of this definition and make sure that R satisfies it. So we've already checked this first bit, which basically says that R works properly on the objects. And then we have to make sure that it satisfies this. For an arrow E from some object Y to some object X in our category C, the integers here, um, we're going to have the R of E that is where E gets lifted under this functor R, is got to be the unique arrow from R of Y to R of X, such that we have this equation holding, epsilon X after L of H equals E after epsilon of Y, okay? So we've already seen how we can construct um, this terminal morphism here with R of X and Epsilon X and in a similar way we get R of Y and Epsilon Y going into Y from L after R of Y and that's the terminal morphism from L to Y okay um, and we're supposing now we have this arrow E from Y to X so we want to basically lift that over here and make sure that it satisfies the right condition, okay? Um, so, how are we gonna do it? Well, firstly, we need to pick a Y which is less than or equal to X, okay? Uh, because we need it to actually be an arrow here in this category of integers. So we have to pick some Y which is less than or equal to X. Why not we pick Y, why don't we pick Y equals X minus one? That'll do the job. Um, so if we do that, what we get over here, uh, when we do R on that, we get three times X minus one, okay? Now, what we want is we want there to be a unique intermediary arrow here, which basically makes this square commute, okay? More precisely, um, we remember that if we compose E with epsilon Y, we get this arrow K like so. And now we think of R of Y together with this arrow K as a kind of candidate for being a terminal morphism from L to X, okay? Uh, it's not the real deal. The real deal is R of X with epsilon of X, but this is a kind of phony candidate. And so that means we ought to have a unique intermediary arrow here which if we lift it under L, um, it's going to sort of complete this triangle, okay? Well, that's good because we do have this because it is true that X minus one times three is less than X times three. So we do have an arrow here and it's a unique one because we're dealing with a pre-order. So this is our intermediary arrow H and indeed, if we lift it under L, we get this arrow here, which we could call L of H. Um, well, yeah, let's call it L of H. And because when we're doing composition in these kind of uh, pre-ordered sets, um, we always get this kind of unique arrow. We know that this has to make this square commute because just another path 
from here to here and there's only one arrow from here to here because we're dealing with a pre-ordered set. So that shows then that epsilon x after L of h is equal to E after epsilon of y and that's this equation. Okay, so we've basically done the job now and we can call this h here, we can now rightly call it r of e. That is where this arrow ought to get lifted to under our functor. And if you think about this, it really makes sense in the context of pre-ordered sets. I mean, here we have a uh, integer y, which is less than an integer x. Uh, if we times them both by three, we get a real number r, which is less than a real number we get a real number r of y which is less than a real number r of x okay uh, so this all makes perfect sense and we've basically demonstrated that in this case of pre-orders we have this definition holding okay so i really like this definition of adjoint functors which is based around this idea of terminal morphisms or universal morphisms. Uh, the reason is because really when we look at this definition we see that the right adjoint to L exists precisely when there's a universal morphism from L to any object of our category. Okay, And then the rest of the details are basically saying well how is that right adjoint defined on the arrows and so forth. Um, however, I do admit that the definition uh, does involve a lot of reasoning about universal morphisms. And so if it's the first time you've seen it, it maybe seems a bit peculiar. So what I thought I'd do is basically show how that definition emerges um, as a kind of generalization of what we saw when we were defining the functor based on the categorical product before okay so we saw in an earlier video i think it was duality and functors um how this kind of categorical product when it's defined for any pair of objects um we have this kind of functor emerging and the way that functor works on arrows is all very naturally defined now that construction of the product functor it's really just a special case of an application of that definition. So basically what I'm going to do is go through that description of the categorical product and then I'm going to just write it down and generalize it. I'm going to show how we get this important definition um, of adjoint functors that I've just been talking about, how we can sort of obtain that as a generalization of what we saw with the categorical product and then we'll really get a feel for where that definition comes from because essentially the product functor is nothing more than the right adjoint to the diagonal functor okay we're going to see this in detail okay so in this example we're going to look at the categorical product as a functor and we're basically going to see how we can how we can define the categorical product as a functor. But we're going to use this language of universal morphisms to do it. Now, this kind of construction is going to be relying on quite a lot of stuff which was discussed in the video Duality and Functors and in the video Universal Properties category for beginners videos on those topics so if this construction doesn't isn't clear to you you might want to watch those videos again um, alternatively you know you can just speed through this and then so we're going to look at some equivalent ways to define adjoint functors where we don't discuss universal morphisms at all so there are other ways into this subject of adjoint functors but basically, in this construction, we're going to start with this diagonal functor and we're going to arrive at a way of sort of set setting up what this product functor is. But we describe it really in the language of 
universal morphisms. That's what these two statements here do. And basically, once we've gone through this, it's going to be very easy to guess a description of adjoint functors because all we're going to do when we're finished is replace this diagonal functor with a general functor, L, and replace this d times d here with a general kind of functor c and then this statement here is going to be basically saying that this functor r here is the right adjoint of this functor l so what i'm really doing here i'm really sort of demonstrating that the product functor is the right adjoint of the diagonal functor. Let's just start to interpret what this, what this means, okay? So let's go through it. Firstly, we have d times d. So what's d times d? So the objects of d times d are going to be pairs of objects, an object from d paired with an object from d. So here's another object of this category, d times d, and then the arrows are going to be pairs of arrows. An arrow f from a bar to a, and an arrow g from b bar to b, okay? So, and then the way that we compose arrows is like, um, for example, f star, g star after f comma g is going to be f after it's going to be f star after f g star after g okay so that's the way this category d times d works and the other thing we have here is this triangle thing here this is the diagonal functor. Okay, so how does this work? Well, it works on a object in D. The way it works is that when we, when we operate this diagonal functor on an object, we just get the pair of objects with that one repeated. So that's going to be a member of D times D. And how does this diagonal functor work on arrows? Well, if we have an arrow F from A to C, then D of F, then the diagonal functor operating on f is going to send it to this arrow f comma f. So that's how this diagonal functor works. So our first challenge then is to understand what this first kind of sentence means above this blue line. So what we want to really understand is what does it mean for us to have a terminal morphism from this diagonal functor to a comma b? Well what's that mean? It means that we have some object in this category d which I'm calling r of a comma b. Now I also want to call this something else. I want to call it a times b because this is nothing more than just the um, than just the kind of categorical product of a and b. Okay, so let's call it. So we could call this object r of a comma b, and we could call it a times b. I'm going to call it a times b for the time being, but just for the time being, let's just think of that as a name, okay? Um, so there's some object in D 
which is named A times B. So we're talking about a terminal morphism from this diagonal functor to A comma B. And it consists of an object and an arrow which goes from where this object gets sent to under this functor here. So it goes from delta of A times B to A comma B. What's delta of A times B? Well, another way we could say it is it's just the pair A times B comma A times B. So another way we could say this is that we have an arrow in the category D, we have an arrow pi one from A times B to A and an arrow pi two from A times B to B. These are our projections. Um, so anyway, that's the first part of this is just, we haven't really, um, we haven't really fleshed out um, what it means for this thing to be a terminal morphism, but at least we've got the right kind of structure. It's an object in D and an arrow from where the object lands under this functor to our object of interest, A comma B. So the next part of our setup is to say that for any similar kind of thing, for any Z, which it's kind of image under delta, has an arrow into our object of interest, say an arrow P comma Q, According to the definition of a terminal morphism, we ought to, there ought to be a unique arrow in this category D, which if we lift it under delta, it makes this diagram commute and allows us to replicate the effect of this arrow um, from delta Z to A comma B um, using it. So that means that there's going to be a unique arrow H, which has the property that delta of H makes this diagram commute, okay? So that's just the definition of a terminal morphism. Now, let's see what this actually means. Um, and we'll see that this basically is giving us the definition of the categorical product of A and B. So what do we have? Well, there's A comma B and we have this terminal morphism, A times B with these arrows, pi one, pi two. So here's A times B and we have an arrow pi one from A times B to A. And we have an arrow pi two from A times B to B. there's A and there's B. And this has the property that for any Z, which has an arrow P from Z to A, and an arrow Q from Z to B, we have that there's going to exist a unique H from Z to A times B, which has the property that delta of H makes this diagram commute. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that pi one comma pi two after delta of H, well, we know that's just H comma H,
equals PQ. Okay, so we know that, so that means that P here is equal to pi one after H. P is equal to pi one after H and Q is equal to pi two after H. Q is equal to pi two after H, okay? So this just basically gives us exactly the definition of the categorical product. And what this first statement really says is that um, for every pair of objects in D, we have a categorical product, okay? It's actually saying more than that because we're really saying that there's a functor R from this category D times D to D and the image of A comma B is this categorical product. Now, of course, categorical product um, is, the categorical product of a pair of objects is not necessarily unique, okay? Um, but it's unique up to isomorphism. So any two things which could be considered to be a categorical product of a pair of objects are isomorphic. So uh, R isn't really uniquely specified um, by saying this, but it's specified in such a way that if we have two um, kind of possible ways to set the image of A comma B under R, then they're going to be isomorphic to each other. So that's enough for us. Okay, so now we know what this first part means. Now I want to carry on. So firstly, I want to use this kind of R notation a bit more. So instead of calling this A times B, I might want to call it R of A comma B. Now what that means is that we have this functor R, which somehow goes from, which somehow goes from the product of category D to itself to this category D and somehow sends A comma B to this thing up here. Uh, now this is actually our product functor, okay? And it's, this is what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to arrive at that kind of, um, that kind of conclusion. But for the moment, you could just think of this as an alternative name for some object in this category D. It just happens to be called R of A comma B, okay? We don't need to worry too much about that yet. But it, it does mean that we have another way to talk about what this object is here. Um, and so this now has another name as well. So this is what we get when we operate this delta, this diagonal functor on this thing. So we could also call it delta of R of A comma B. Okay. Um, I actually prefer to call it delta after R operating on a comma B because it's a bit cleaner. It means the same thing. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're going to see how these kind of arrows under this product functor are defined. So if you recall from the video uh, duality and functors, we showed how this product functor works and how this product functor operates on how we can sort of get the product of arrows as well as the product of of objects and we're going to get that kind of notion uh, from this sort of construction so there's really two steps to it the first step is a sort of um Kind of clever usage of this notion of terminal morphisms um, which is going to infer that there's going to be a certain kind of special arrow in this category d which 
is going to do what we want. Um, and then the second step is to interpret that and to see that it is the same, um, it gives us the same idea as this kind of categorical product of arrows, okay? Um, so let's see how this works. So let's suppose that there's another object. A bar comma B bar in this category D times D. And let's suppose that there's an arrow from that object to A comma B. Let's call this arrow F comma G. So that means there's an arrow F from A bar to A and there's an arrow G from G bar to G to B. There's an arrow G from B bar to B. Okay, now what are we going to do? Well, the first step is that we're going to use this kind of terminal morphism thing again. Okay, so there's going to be a terminal morphism from our diagonal functor delta to a bar comma b bar. Okay, so what's that going to look like? Well, that's going to be an object in this category D here that we can call R of a bar comma b bar. We could also just call it a bar times b bar because it's going to be the categorical product of a bar and b bar. But you know, let's just call it that for now because this is fitting with this notation. So we're going to have this object over here and it has the feature that if we lift it under this delta functor here, uh, then there's an arrow from where it lands into A bar comma B bar. So it lands here. This is its image. Delta after R of A bar comma B bar. And then the other part of the universal morphism is going to be this arrow like this. Pi 1 bar, comma, pi 2 bar. Now, here's the clever bit. Uh, don't worry if you don't get this straight away. We're going to um, come across lots of examples where we're going to see this same trick that I'm just about to do um, repeated. But here's the basic idea, okay? Um, we know that this thing here, R of AB and pi 1 pi 2, is a terminal morphism from delta to A comma B. And that means that for any similar kind of thing, there's going to be a unique arrow in D, which, um, which if we lift it on the delta, it makes this diagram commute, okay? Um, so we're going to use that idea. In particular, if we compose this arrow here with this arrow here, we get an arrow which goes from here to here. Let's call this arrow V. Its long name is F comma G after pi one bar comma pi two bar. Okay. Now R of A comma B bar is an object in D and this V here 
is an arrow from where it lands under the diagonal functor to a comma b and so that means that there's going to be a unique kind of arrow h with the property that if we lift this arrow h under this functor delta it's going to make this triangle commute okay and this h it turns out is exactly what we want and what we could consider to be f times g the kind of categorical product of this arrow f and this arrow g delta of h here uh, is going to make this commute in the sense that this arrow v here um, is going to be pi 1 comma pi 2 after delta h and what's this green arrow well it's just it turns out that it's just exactly what we're looking for it's the categorical product of arrow f and arrow g okay so there's a tiny mistake in this definition here so I, okay so i wrote a tiny mistake in this definition here i wrote a, a circle here where i should have put a comma here okay so please bear in mind that this should be on this right hand side it should be f comma g after pi one bar comma pi two bar not f circle g we're going to see that it really does boil down to this familiar notion of finding the kind of categorical product of arrows um, but let's just reread this definition first just to um, see that this is what we're doing so we're saying that for each arrow f comma g from a bar to b we have the r of f comma g so that's what i'm calling so that's an, yet another name for this arrow h it's also called r of f comma g um, is the unique h from r a comma a bar comma b bar to r of a comma b such that pi 1 pi 2 after delta h so that's pi 1 pi 2 after delta h is equal to f comma g after pi 1 bar comma pi 2 bar so another way to say that is it's equal to it's equal to this blue arrow here okay that's f comma g after pi 1 bar comma pi 2 bar okay now let's have a look uh, so now what we're going to do is just interpret this in terms of a diagram okay we're really going to make sense of what this means so So firstly, what does this mean here? Well, this is going to be delta of A bar times B bar. So it's just going to be A bar times B bar, comma, A bar times B bar. Okay, so Okay, so let's just interpret this stuff in a more down-to-earth way in terms of the category D. So we have this object A bar times B bar. And we have that there's an arrow pi 1 bar, which goes from it. To A bar. Similarly, we have that there's an arrow pi 2 bar, which is an arrow from A bar times B bar to B bar. So pi 1 goes to A bar and pi 2 goes to B bar. Now what else do we have? We have this arrow F from A bar to A. And we have this arrow G from B bar to B.
And we also have this set up here. So we have an arrow pi one from A times B to A. And we have an arrow pi two from A times B to B. And now what all this argument is saying, what, what this sentence is saying here, is that we can consider the kind of image of f comma g under this product functor r. In other words, we can consider f times g to be this unique arrow from a bar times b bar to a times b which is going to make this diagram commute, okay? In what sense is it going to make it commute? Well, if you remember the way that we argued about um, setting up this thing, this H, which we can also consider F times G, the way we did it is we said, well, f after pi 1 can be considered to be an arrow from a bar times b bar to a and g after we we said that f after pi 1 bar can be considered to be an arrow from a bar times b bar to a and similarly g after pi 2 bar can be considered to be an arrow from a bar times b bar to b and so now we can think of this as a sort of candidate for being the categorical product where this is the actual one. So that means it has to be this unique arrow, H, and it has to have the property that, um, which makes this diagram commute. And that's what we define as the categorical product, um, F times G. Now, so this is just how we define the categorical product of uh, arrows before. We said that it's going to be this unique intermediary arrow that makes this diagram commute, okay? So what does that mean specifically? Well, it means that f after pi 1 bar is equal to pi 1 after h and g after pi 2 bar is equal to pi 2 after h and that is exactly what we have here okay so if we just remember now that what delta h is is it's just h comma h then we see that these two conditions are exactly the same okay we want pi 1 after h is f after pi 1 bar pi 1 after h is f after pi 1 bar and pi 2 after h is g after pi 2 bar and that's this okay so all this is saying is just that this r of f comma g here is just going to be the categorical product of f and g according to the definition which we've already seen so now we know that let's reinterpret what this second sentence says I mean, let's just go through it again to make sure we know what it means. So it says that for each arrow, f comma g from a bar from a bar comma b bar to a comma b, we have that r of f comma g is going to be the unique h in this category d, which has a property that if we lift it, it makes this diagram commute when we use this sort of blue arrow that we constructed by composing these two okay 
Um, so it says that the unique h from r of a bar comma b bar to r of a comma b, which has the property that pi one after h is equal to f after pi one bar and pi two after h is equal to g after pi two bar. Okay, so this was a so this was a mistake uh, before um, I accidentally wrote f after g here instead of f comma g. So now we have these equations here. We can see that this is exactly what we have here. Okay, because delta h here is just h comma h, and so we have exactly these equations. We have that pi one after h is f after pi one bar and pi two after h is g after pi two bar. So this is exactly what we want. So all this is boiling down to is saying that this is the way that we define the categorical product of a pair of arrows. Okay, it's, it's this setup. Okay, so what does all this mean then? Well, what it basically means is that if the categorical product is defined, so what it means in terms of categorical products is it says that if the categorical product of every pair of objects is defined um, and we set up a sort of, so in other words, if, if it's R of A comma B is defined, if this is the way that we're uh, we're sort of sending pairs of objects to their categorical product and then this second sentence tells us how to set up tells us how to define the kind of categorical product of arrows it tells us how to define the way that this r functor works on a pair of arrows f comma g and what this exactly says, this statement here is equivalent to the statement that, that this product functor R here is the right adjoint of the diagonal functor. So all I need to do now to give you a definition of adjoint functors is to just take this statement here and just replace this category D times D here with some arbitrary category C and replace this diagonal functor here with some functor L, kind of arbitrary functor. So replace this A comma B here with some arbitrary object of this category, which we're now calling C. So this is just some object X in this category C and then replace R of A comma B with X and now this thing which is an arrow in in this category on the left here this category I'm now calling C this just becomes a sort of general arrow in this category so I'm going to call this arrow epsilon x and now I'm just going to make these replacements here and I'm going to replace this arrow f comma g here I'm now going to call this e because it's just a sort of general arrow in this left hand category I'm going to call this here a uh, call I'll call now I'll I'll uh, call a comma b bar. I'm going to call this y. A comma b. I'm going to call x.
So this is going to become R of E. And now this unique H is going to go from R of Y. to R of X, this pi one bar comma pi two bar, that becomes epsilon of Y, that f comma g becomes e delta of h here becomes l of h and pi one comma pi two becomes epsilon of x and this is exactly the general definition so all I've done here is made these replacements I've replaced my diagonal functor I've replaced this category d times d with a general and we have to replace a comma b here that's just going to become a, a general object x in this category c So when we make these sort of replacements, what we end up with is just exactly the kind of definition or a definition of what it means for this functor R to be the right adjoint of this functor L. OK, so this definition, I'm going to explain it in more detail, um, but essentially it is um, telling us how to set up this functor R given this functor L that has this special property that it has all these terminal, that there's a terminal morphism from L to every object in this category on the left here. Um, and so, you know, this is a definition, this is a sort of central definition in a way. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is in my opinion, one of the most illuminating kind of constructions with respect to understanding what adjoint functors are. So we're basically going to start out like before. We're going to assume that R is the right adjoint of this functor L. So this functor R from C to D is the right adjoint of this functor L, which goes from D to C. And we're going to start with a single arrow E going from an object Y to an object X in this category C. And we're just going to see what gets implied. So what does get implied? Well, just to give you a kind of preview, basically, we're going to see that there's a there's sort of anti-symmetry going on. There's this situation we've already discussed in this category C, where we have, um, you know, we have terminal morphisms from this functor L to objects of this category C. And we see, um, we've already discussed how that explain how that implies various things are going on in this category D and it also implies that we end up with this natural transformation epsilon which goes from L after R to the identity functor of C um, but what we're going to see is that there's a sort of anti-symmetric situation which gets implied to occur in this category D um, that you know for any object A in D it turns out there's an initial morphism from A 
to R. And there's just a lot going on. There's, there's also a natural transformation, which we're going to call eta, which goes from the identity functor of D to the functor the functor R after L. There's so much going on, okay? So let's just begin. Uh, we start with this arrow, E, from this object X to this object Y. Okay, so first thing then is that we're assuming that R is the right adjoint to this functor L. So that means that for every object X in this category C, we're gonna have one of these terminal morphisms from L to X. Okay, so what's that look like? Well, it means that there's gonna be an object R of X that has the property that if we do L on it, we get L after R of X. And then epsilon x is going to go from that thing to x. So that's our terminal morphism to x. We also have a similar story for y, okay? So there's a terminal morphism to y that constitutes an object r of y in this category D, and it has a feature that L after R of Y has this arrow epsilon Y, which goes to Y, okay? Um, so what's next in this story? Well, we've already done this part of the construction once. Um, the next part of the story is we say, okay, E after epsilon Y is going to be an arrow up like this. So maybe we'll call it V. So V equals E after epsilon Y. And now we know that R of Y is an object of this category D, and this V here is another arrow from the sort of L image of that object into X. So that's kind of like a candidate for being a terminal morphism from L to X. So we know that there has to be this intermediary arrow. This is just what we've done already. Okay, we know that there's this intermediary arrow which we could call R of E, just a unique one that has the feature that if we apply this functor L, we get this arrow over here. Which we may call L after R of E. Okay, we've already done this construction. What I want to do now is just make things a bit easier. Um, I want to consider alternative names for things, okay? So as an alternative name for R of Y, I would suggest A. So maybe we'll call R of Y A. And maybe we'll call R of X B. And that gives us these alternative names over here. Oh, and also maybe we'll call R of E as a potential alternative name. Maybe we'll call it G, okay? So we can also think of this arrow that just got generated. We could say it's an arrow G from A to B in this category D, okay? So that gives us alternative names for this stuff over here. 
we could also call this L of G. And we could also call this L of B. And we could also call this L of A. All right, so that's just coming up with extra possible names for things. It's, it's not really um, anything conceptually different, okay? Um, right, so here's the next part. Okay, so now comes the really interesting part of this construction. Um, so basically, what we've just done is consider some terminal, we've considered, for example, a terminal morphism from L to X. And we've seen that that constitutes this object R of X and this arrow from where it lands under L to X. And remember, we're assuming that there's a terminal morphism from L to every object in this category C. So we sort of come up with these new objects, L of B and L of A here, uh, by this construction. And what we're going to do is just repeat that kind of process. So we're now going to say, what about a terminal morphism from L to L of B? OK, so if you just apply the definition, then it works out. So such a terminal morphism is going to correspond to an object R after L of B over here in this category D, which is going to have an image over here. Okay, the names get a bit long now. Um, the image of this guy is going to be L after R after L of B. And so the other part of this terminal morphism from L to L of B is this arrow, epsilon L of B, which goes like this. Now we're just going to do a similar story um, making a terminal morphism from L to this object here, L of A. So that's going to correspond to an arrow R after L of A and this arrow here, epsilon L of A, which is going to go into L of A from the image of this object here which is L after R after L of A. Okay then, so we've got some extra objects over here. Now, what do we do next? Well, the next step is quite straightforward. All we're going to do is make some extra copies of L of A of L of B and draw some identity arrows in. So there's another copy of L of A, and we know that there's going to be an identity arrow. ID L of A, like this. And a similar story going on with L of B. So here's the sort of really interesting part of this construction, where we see the kind of anti-symmetry I mean, this is just my own descriptive term. I'm not sure if it's exactly accurate, but I call it kind of anti-symmetry. And we see this come about right at this point. So what we do now, we say, OK, we know that. We know that R after L of B and epsilon L of B is a terminal morphism from L to L of B. And let's consider another kind of candidate for being a, a terminal morphism um, 
to this object L of B. So that's going to constitute an object B and this arrow ID L of B, which goes from the image of this object L of B to L of B. Okay, so this is kind of like a um, candidate for being a tonal morphism. So what do we know about it then? Well, so then we can imply the definition of this terminal morphism and say, well, that means there has to be a unique intermediary arrow, which I'm going to call eta, which I'm going to call eta of B. And that has the feature that the image of this under L is going to make this diagram commute, okay? So what's the image of this eta under this functor L? Well, the image of this arrow eta here, this unique one, has to go from L of B to L after R after L of B. So here's the image of this arrow eta. Okay, and then this has to make this triangle commute, okay, in the sense that ID L of B is going to be epsilon L of B after L of eta of B, okay? So now we're just going to go through that same line of reasoning, but looking at the A's instead, and then we're done, okay? So we know that R after L of A, together with epsilon L of A, forms a terminal morphism from L to this object L of A. And we can consider A together with ID L of A as a kind of candidate for being a terminal morphism from L to L of A. And that means that, and that means that there's going to be this unique arrow Which we'll call eta of A from A to R after L of A, this image is going to make this diagram commute. So the image of this arrow is going to go from it's going to go like this. So this is going to be L of E to A, and this has the property that ID L of A is epsilon of L of A after L of E to A, okay? So this is making this triangle commute. And just one final thing, which is easy, is that we know that this arrow here is G, and that this arrow is going to get lifted under this functor R after L, okay? So that means that this thing here, I'm going to draw it in a different colour, yep. Yeah, um, there's going to be this arrow here. R after L of G. And so basically, we start to see that there's some structure coming about in D, and it turns out that we could also infer this structure here in C from what's going on in D. There's a kind of anti-symmetry going on here. And let me just state some remarkable facts. One remarkable fact is that this eta here can actually be considered to be a natural transformation from the identity functor of D to R after L. And this is perhaps the most remarkable fact of all, um, which is that if we have an object A in this category D, then L of A, um, which is going to be this object over here, together with eta A, actually is going to be an initial morphism from A to this functor R. Okay, so it's really a kind of anti-symmetric situation going on. And all this stuff gets implied. It's, it's very, very remarkable. So what we're going to do next is, I mean, I'm trying to um, expose this connection here. 
I just wanted to give enough motivation for us then to start looking at things from the perspective of this category D. So if we just look at things from the perspective of this category D now um, and think about the construction from there, we'll see that it's a very kind of similar story and it implies that stuff's happening in C. We've, okay, so now we've seen one definition of adjoint functors. Let's look at another one um, that's sort of like a kind of dual um, definition. So it's an equivalent definition. So we've got the same setup as before. Uh, and this definition, um, we're going to have a look at this eta again. And this is the same eta that we saw before. But now we're going to make our definition sort of centered upon it. So we've got the same setup as before. We've got a category C and a category D, a functor R going from C to D and a functor L going from D to C. Now, I'm saying that L is the left adjoint to this functor R if and only if this statement in the blue circle holds. So this symbol here means if and only if. It means the green statement implies the blue statement. The blue statement implies the green statement. Okay. Um, so what's this definition, which is equivalent to saying that L is the left adjoint to R? Well, it's that we have a natural transformation, eta, and this is going to be a natural transformation from the identity functor of this category D to R after L of D. Okay, so the picture would be something like, here's an object A under the identity functor that's just sent to itself. Um, and the alternative is to do L on it and then do R back again And that'll give us R after L of A. And then the eighth component of this natural transformation eta here is going to go from A to R after L of A. So yeah, we, we have this natural transformation um, and we want it to be such that we have a load of initial morphisms, okay? Basically, we have an initial morphism from every object A in our category D and the kind of first element in the pair of those initial morphisms um, is sort of labeled by this functor L, okay? So what do I mean by this? Well, here's an object. Okay, so let me just read it out properly. I'm saying that L is the left adjoint to R, if and only if we have a natural transformation from the identity functor of R to R after L, um, which is such that for every object A in D, we have the L of A comma E to A is an initial morphism from A to R. Okay, so what does this initial morphism look like? Well, L of A is going to be an object of C. And it has a property that there's a arrow, E to of A, which goes from our object to A. To the image of this object under this functor R, okay? So this is R of L of A. I kind of prefer to write this as R 
R after L of A. It's a sort of meter, okay? Um, so that's what the initial morphism from A to R looks like. But um, what it ha but it has to have but this initial morphism has to have a special property, and that is that for anything kind of similar, so for any object X So for any object X in this category C, we have that if there's an arrow V from A to the image of this object X under R, so it's a kind of similar thing, it's sort of pretender or candidate for this job well then there has to be a unique kind of arrow in C that image uh, makes this diagram commute and allows us to sort of replicate the effect of this pretender okay so what I'm saying is that for every object x an arrow v from a to r of x there has to exist a unique arrow F which is such that R of F makes this diagram commute in the sense that V is equal to R of F after E to A. Okay, so this is the definition then uh, of an adjunction from this kind of perspective. Now So what we're basically saying is that for every object A, we have this kind of initial morphism from A to R. And that's just defined so that for anything similar, so for any other object of C, X, which has an image R of X in D with an arrow from V from A to R of X, we have that there's a unique arrow F from L of A to X, such that R of F after E to A equals V. Okay, so there's an equivalent um, way to say that L is the left adjoint to R. And it's basically the same as the last thing that we said. It's just that in the previous kind of statements, I said more about these arrows eta from A to R after L of A and less about the nature of this functor L. So in the previous definition I said yeah okay for every object in D we have these initial morphisms and also we have um, their components are form, forming a natural transformation. Now I quite like that definition but it does include the, the notion of a initial, it does include the notion of a natural transformation. And much as I like natural transformations, I think that sort of sweeps quite a lot of information under the rug, if you like, because we have all these commuting squares and so on. Um, so I prefer this sort of definition um, because it, really boils everything down to the concrete kind of object arrows and functors sort of language. Um, so basically in this definition um, it's just the same except we don't say that eta is a natural transformation. I mean it is but we don't say it. We just say that for every a um, we have this arrow from R after L, we have this arrow from A to R after L of A, um, and we don't sort of stipulate that this has to be a natural transformation in the definition, 
so we're sort of saying less in that respect, but we say more in the respect that we actually talk about how this functor L is defined properly. Okay, so uh, what's this definition say then? It says that, so this is an equivalent way to define that L is the left adjoint to R, where we have our usual setup, um, L going from category D to category C and so on. So we say that L is the left adjoint to R when for every object A in this category D, we have this initial morphism L of A comma E to A, um, where A goes, where E to A goes from A to R after L of A. And that's going to be an initial morphism from A to this functor R. So this sort of defines our objects, um, or at least it says we pick our objects um, in such a way that, you know, every object is a, um, is corresponding to the first part of a pair in these initial morphisms. Um, but then we're also going to specify how these arrows are defined. So remember last time I said, oh, well, we have an arrow F um, from A to B when we have this kind of setup and with a kind of, because of the natural transformations, I said, oh, that arrow F has to equal L of G. Um, this time, I'm actually going to say what L of G is, and then we're going to see that the naturality um, of this eta is implied. Okay, so we say that this functor not only does it produce um, these objects here, which are part of our initial morphisms, um, the way that it works on an arrow G from A to B is that L of G is going to be this unique arrow from L of A to L of B, which makes this diagram, which the image of which under R makes this diagram commute, okay? So we're saying that L of G is the unique arrow from L of A to L of B, such that we have uh, this diagram commuting. So R after L of G, after E to A, is equal to e to b after g okay so remember we have to have such an arrow um, in this category c that's image makes this um, diagram commute uh, because of these initial morphisms here so how do we know that this definition here is equivalent to the last one well basically the definitions look the same apart from here where saying this extra stuff about L, how it's operating on arrows. In the previous one, we said that um, eta here um, was a natural transformation. Now, I argued that L of G is determined like this when we um, said that eta had to be a natural transformation. So the previous statement about L being left at adjoint to R clearly implies this statement. Why does this statement imply the previous one? Well, because from this, we know that eta has to be natural. Why do we know that? Well, this is exactly the naturality condition, okay? Um, R after L of G after eta A equals eta B after G. So that's saying that going this way around the square um, gives the same result as going this way around the square. So this is clearly an equivalent definition. And yeah, I must say I kind of prefer it because I think it really gets to the core of what's going on with the junctions. OK, so I've recorded this video on the junctions over quite a long time, and I actually have been using slightly different notation at different times. So I just wanted to clarify this. Uh, sometimes I'll write HOM, A, B, to denote the set of arrows in category C from A to B. 
and I may also write it like this as C open bracket A comma B all right but I mean the same thing and when I'm talking about the hom functors or the arrow based functors um, you know again I'm using the same again I'm using either of these types of notation to basically talk about the same thing okay so what we want to do now is take this definition of an adjunction um, which says that we have a natural transformation from the identity functor of D to R after L and for every object A in D we have that L of A comma eta of A is an initial morphism from A to R and we want to take this and we want to arrive at our arrow set based definition of an adjunction so we want to show that this implies the arrow based definition of an adjunction so we really want to define this kind of natural isomorphism from this kind of arrow set functor to this kind of arrow set functor. So the way we're going to define it is that for a G in a G which is an arrow from L of A to X, we're going to send that G to R of G after E to A. So G goes from L of A to X, so R of G is going to go from R after L of A to R of X And E to A is going to go from A to R after L of A. So clearly R of G after Eta is going to go from A to R of X. And that's what we want. So it has the right kind of uh, target set. Now... Um, what we want to do is to show that this is actually an isomorphism. So we're going to consider a element of this target set here, an arrow from A to R of X. We're assuming this definition up here. So we have this arrow H from A to R of X. Now, what we can do is think of this as a kind of candidate, a failing candidate for a for being a initial morphism from A to R. So we have this actual initial morphism E to A, L of A, and we have this candidate H X. So what that means is that there is going to be a unique arrow, is that there's going to be a unique G. from the real deal to this kind of candidate X. This is all happening in the category C, but this stuff's happening in the category D. Um, so in C, there's going to be this arrow, a unique arrow, in fact, from L of A to X, which we'll call G, that has an image which makes this diagram commute. So that's R of G. So we have that G is this unique arrow, such that R of G after E to A is H. So there it is. And so that means that this G here is precisely the thing that get sent to this G that we discussed earlier. So these, so that means that this G here must be precisely this G here. Uh, and this shows that we have an isomorphism. 
because this G we've obtained, we've shown that it's unique um, and it has the property, of course, that if we apply psi of a comma x to it, then we're going to get h. So this kind of mapping defined like this is the inverse of this. So that shows that um, this kind of psi is an isomorphism. This one is based on natural transformations. So, okay, so an adjunction then between these categories C and D, it consists of functors. So we have a, a functor R from C to D and a functor L from D to C. Now, the other thing we need is these natural transformations. So we have this natural transformation here, which we call the unit. And that's going to be a natural transformation from the identity functor of D to this functor R after L, okay, which goes from D to itself. The other thing we need is this natural transformation here, which is involving C, and that goes from L after R to the identity functor of C, and this is called the co-unit. Now the final thing we need is for this unit and co-unit to satisfy two equations um, which are called the triangle, called the triangular identities, okay? And they're basically saying that this diagram commutes and this diagram commutes. Now, these are diagrams in the kind of functor category. So, like this one is a diagram where the objects are functors from D to C. And this one is a diagram where the objects are functors from C to D. The definition of an adjunction is that we need these two diagrams to commute. Just to finish the definition of an adjunction, when we have all this stuff, okay, we have an adjunction, that's the definition. And also we say that L is the left adjoint to R and R is the right adjoint to L. So now what I want to do is to show how we can get from this kind of arrow set based definition of an adjunction to our definition of a, an adjunction involving the unit and the co-unit. So when we have um, this kind of natural isomorphism, how can we obtain our unit? Well, what we can do is if we take this expression and then we say, let's let X equal L of A. Okay, so it's just a substitution. Well, okay. Um, now let's see if we can find something inside this set here this set of arrows from L of A to L of A. Well, one thing we know for sure about this set is that it has an element ID L of A. And it turns out that if we just apply this natural isomorphism to that element, then we actually obtain our unit. And that makes sense. I mean, the Eighth component of a unit goes from A to R after L of A. And so, you know, it, it's a member of this set of arrows in D from A to R after L of A. Um, so what I'm saying here is that this gives us the eighth component of our unit. So this is the connection, okay? Um, we just take this general expression and then we substitute x equals L of A to get this expression. And then we just do our natural isomorphism on the identity arrow and we actually obtain the eighth 
component of this unit. So this is how you go from so this is how you get your units from the arrow base definition of an adjunction. Okay, so we've got the units now from our arrow set base definition of an adjunction. Let's get the co-unit too. Okay, so the co-unit is a natural transformation from L after R to the identity funk door of C. So the X component goes from L after R of X to x okay so how can we get that well we write this um, sort of isomorphism thing which lies at the heart of the kind of arrow set based definition of an adjunction but this time we'll consider the kind of inverse so remember psi is an isomorphism so it has an inverse psi to the minus one which goes from the arrow set from a to r of x to the arrow set from L of A to X and C, okay? So what we're gonna do now is just take this expression and then we're gonna substitute in, we're gonna suppose that A equals R of X. And that's gonna give us this expression here, describing how this isomorphism works in this case. So it goes from the set of arrows from R of X to R of X, to the set of arrows from L after R of X to X. And now we'll just do the same trick again. Do we know any elements that will be in this set? Yes, we do. ID R of X. And if we do this inverse Psi thing on it, That will give us something which goes from L after R of X to X. And this is precisely the X component of our co-unit. Okay, so I'm really enjoying this particular moment in making this series because we've climbed so high on this kind of ladder of abstraction that now we can just show pictures like this with very little information seemingly on them, which probably have more meaning than most of the other things I've been saying, because what I'm representing in this diagram, you see I've written co-product to the left of diagonal. So what I mean by that is that the co-product functor um, would be the left adjoint to the diagonal functor. And that would be the left adjoint to the product functor. And that would be the left adjoint to the exponential functor. So this is an enormous amount of information. Now, these functors may not exist, okay? It may not be the case that um, there'll be a product of a pair of objects. Um, even harder to satisfy is that there would be a product for every pair of objects in C. Uh, but if that is the case, then this product functor does exist. Similarly, an exponential functor may not exist. But if the product functor does exist, and if the exponential functor does exist, then the exponential functor would be the right adjoint to the product functor. So I've already tried to argue uh, this kind of relationship, that the product functor is the right adjoint to the diagonal functor, but you see how this kind of relationship goes much further. If we instead of take the left adjoint of a diagonal functor, we get the co-product functor, which tells us how we can kind of um, think of co-products as a functor on a category. Um, so this really is showing an amazing amount of kind of synergy. But, so this picture here is really showing an amazing amount of synergy going on in category theory and as you can probably imagine this is really just the tip of the iceberg there's a fantastically rich theory of adjoint functors and so um i really recommend you pick any of these cases and then see if you can convince yourself for example that the co-product is the left adjoint of the diagonal functor and so on it's very rewarding to do this kind of thing
Okay, so here's another really beautiful kind of relationship between our joint functors. So when you first start studying category theory, one of the things you notice is that categories look a lot like graphs. Indeed, they are kind of graphs with extra structure um, about arrow composition. And so it's possible to take a category and forget about the kind of um, compositional structure and just think of it as a graph. And there's a functor that corresponds to that. It's called a forgetful functor. It takes a category and just gives you the kind of underlying graph in this category of graphs. Now, as I said earlier, adjunctions are sort of like inverses. They're not exactly inverses usually, but um, if we take the left adjoint to this forgetful functor, which is kind of boring really in some sense, um, we get this extremely interesting functor called the free functor. And what this does is it takes a graph and it forms a so-called free category. Um, basically, um, it gets a graph and this graph has paths on it. And what it does is it sort of fills out the graph um, by taking what's called the kind of transitive closure. That just means... Um, you get all the different sequences of paths which could be present, all the sequences of edges you could walk along. And then each of those becomes represented as an arrow in a category. And it's a so-called sort of free category because these arrows, these paths are just sort of there. And when we compose two paths together, we just sort of concatenate them, join them together. So we don't have this case where we can kind of compose lots of arrows and then get another kind of different type of arrow. Instead, when we compose arrows, we're just kind of joining the paths to get longer paths. Um, we saw something like this happen when we were looking at this kind of additive monoid of natural numbers, which um, defined, the, um, defined the category of dynamical systems, okay? Um, anyway, um, it turns out that this fascinating free functor is the left adjoint of a forgetful functor. So um, this really gives us a nice connection between this category of categories and this category of graphs. Um, now, I have some material about this. Um, I'm just going to talk over it um, on a computer screen because I already have notes on it there. So uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about this fascinating relationship here. OK, so I'm going to talk on my computer now about how this free functor here, which sends a graph G to a category, is the left adjoint to this forgetful functor here, which sends a category to a graph. So let me start by telling you how this forgetful functor works, because this is really the simplest thing. So suppose we have some category. Now that's going to have a load of objects and some arrows. And there's also a structure involving how those arrows are composed. Now amongst these arrows, there's going to be some identity arrows. What the forgetful functor does to a category is it just forgets about all the compositional structure. So it sends each of these arrows here to a directed edge. It sends each of these objects to a vertex. Even the special identity arrows here just become vanilla kind of self-loop arrows in this graph, okay? A sort of functor between categories. That functor just becomes a graph homomorphism that just maps the vertices and arrows in our, that just maps the vertices and edges in our graph like the objects and arrows got mapped under the functor we're operating on, under, under the functor which we're lifting, okay? So that's how the forgetful functor works. Uh, more interesting is this kind of free functor, which I'm denoting with gamma here. So the way that gamma works is it's a functor that goes the other way around, okay? It operates on a graph and it gives us a category. So like the forgetful functor sort of forgets quite a lot of information uh, when it's 
transforms a category to a graph, this free functor actually kind of um, makes a very rich structure. So what we do is we get a graph, for example, this one here that just has these two edges, A and B, and then we use this to form a category. Now, what happens is that these edges here, A and B, so what happens is that the vertices of this graph become the objects in this category, gamma of G. Uh, however, the edges, and also the edges of G, become arrows in gamma of G. And these are kind of the primary arrows. Um, and there'll be other arrows in gamma of G. In particular, we'll add a identity arrow to each object uh, when we make gamma of G. But what we also do is we take any kind of path which is present in G, and that also becomes an arrow. And we just label that path, and we just label that arrow with the sequence of edges traversed in the corresponding path. And that's how we make this free category here. So for example, here, um, in our graph G, we just have two edges, A and B. Um, and so when we do the free functor on that, we, we get these arrows A and B, but we can also um, form a path by going along A and then B in this graph. So that means there's another arrow in this graph uh, called B after A, which is another arrow like this. And so each of the kind of paths that we have in this graph G becomes an arrow in gamma of G. So now you might be wondering, well, okay, I know what the arrows are in gamma of G, but how do I compose them? Well, the thing is that if you want to compose a couple of arrows in gamma of G, those arrows are just going to correspond to paths in G. That's how gamma of G is defined. And um, those arrows in gamma of G are just going to be labeled with sequences of edges in G, things that you can form a path. So all you do when you compose arrows together in gamma of G is just concatenate the edges. So it's a fairly simple affair in this case because we just have these two edges here in G. And so all we do is just form a new edge, which is their concatenation, and add these identity arrows, and we have gamma of G. However, if this graph G has some sort of closed paths, sort of loops that you can walk around, this uh, free graph gets much more interesting because it ends up having an infinite number of arrows. So here's an example when we have this graph which has a sort of loop in it so we can go along arrow A and then arrow B and get back where we started. When we apply this free functor to this object, we get this category here which has, uh, it has identity arrows added. It has arrows A and B, but it also has this arrow BA and this arrow ABBA. And, and so on. All of these different kind of sequences, and there'll be an infinite number of them, of um, paths that we can make by going round and round this loop become arrows in this free graph. And to concatenate these arrows, we just stick together the sequences of, of edges involved. Um, so it's kind of like the additive monoid of natural numbers. These arrows are essentially sort of like generators. And this is kind of called a free category because we don't add any extra constraints about what happens when we compose arrows. We just sort of stick the names together of the arrows to get new arrows. So you might be wondering now at this point, well, how is this free functor? How, so you might be wondering at this point then, how does this free functor lift arrows? What happens when we have an arrow from a graph G to a graph G dash? What happens when we have this graph homomorphism F here? Well, when we lift this under our free functor, we of course get a functor from the free graph gamma of G to the free graph gamma of G dash. And so what this gives us 
is this functor gamma of f from gamma of g to gamma of g dash. Now, so this works on the objects of gamma of g pretty much like f works on the vertices of g. But the way that gamma of f works on the arrows of gamma of g um, is a little bit more involved. So remember the arrows of gamma of g um, correspond to kind of paths. They correspond to sequences of edges in g. And so what we do is we just apply the graph homomorphism we're sort of lifting um, to each of these edges and we get a new sequence of edges in gamma of g dash. Um, so this is what happens when we apply this kind of um, lifted arrow, this kind of functor here uh, to a particular edge in our free graph, in our free cat to a particular arrow in our free category gamma of g. And the thing that I'm basically claiming is that gamma here, this free functor, is actually the left adjoint of this forgetful functor. So see a very sort of brief illustration of this here. Okay, so what I'm really trying to show here is that gamma is the left adjoint to u. So in particular, what I'm representing here is that if we have a graph G, let's say we want to make an initial morphism uh, from G. Let's say we want to make an initial morphism from G to this functor U. Well, it turns out what that corresponds to is this uh, free graph gamma of G together with this unit component here eta of g and this has the property that if we have any other kind of category like this one here um, which has the feature that if we sort of um, take the free graph of it then there's a homomorphism k from our graph g into it then that implies that there exists this unique functor H uh, from gamma G to D, which has the property that when we lift this functor uh, under U, we are able to kind of get this commuting triangle. So we can uh, emulate the effect of K because K is equal to U of H after eta of G. So this is just part of the demonstration that um, gamma is the left adjoint to this forgetful functor u. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of places you can see online if you just Google free graph or um, if you just Google free categories, um, you can find a lot more information about this fascinating adjunction here. Okay, so we're really able to do something quite amazing once we understand about adjoint functors. We can really look at categories of mathematical objects and we can learn so much just by taking certain forgetful functors, which take some kind of structured set and forget about the structure in some way um, and just get a set as a result. And then if we just ask what are the adjoint functors to that forgetful functor, we get these fascinating other functors which tell us so much about the structure of the things. And we can also kind of go the other way. We can get a set and we can make a kind of basic version of a structured set, in this case a dynamical system, and by taking the adjoints of that, we can learn all sorts of things about how our objects are connected together. What are the sort of fixed points, for example, in a dynamical system and so forth. And the way that all of these functors and things are related together is so 
easy to describe in this language of functors. So um, basically there's a really nice way of laying out, um, there's a really nice way of sort of laying out how functors and adjoint functors are associated with pictures like this. Okay, so for example, I've drawn this functor here. This is a functor called points. It goes from dynamical systems to the category set. And that's to the right of this other functor called discrete. So this is the right adjoint of this functor psi exclamation mark. Um, this is a kind of notation that William Levere uses, and it's very, very useful. So often we denote the left adjoint of a functor with an exclamation mark and the right adjoint of a functor with a star. OK, and what I'm trying to show here are two extremely interesting families of adjoint functors which are relating the category of sets with the category of dynamical systems. Now, let me just tell you briefly about these. So this one, discrete, it takes a set and it changes that set into a dynamical system, a dynamical system full of fixed points. So you might think, oh, well, that's a bit dull, but it's very interesting if we then consider what's the left adjoint to that, because that's a functor which goes from a dynamical system to a set. And what it actually does is it gives us the set of connected components of a dynamical system. So, for example, if you have a dynamical system like this, then that has two connected components. So under this functor here, this will get sent to a set which has two elements. So if this is x, then this would be psi exclamation mark, exclamation mark x. OK, so we can learn about things like how sets are connected together by these sort of special functors, which happen to appear as adjoints of these very basic functors. Much more interesting is what happens in this case. So if we have a forgetful functor, which takes a dynamical system and then just sends it to its set of elements. OK, so, for example, um, phi here would just send this dynamical system to just the set of elements or states. And that's obviously in the category of sets. Well, it turns out that the left adjoint to that is this fascinating kind of free functor, which takes a set and builds a dynamical system out of it. But it's a very, very interesting dynamical system um, involving the natural numbers. Well, OK, maybe it's not that interesting, but the way that it relates to a particular dynamical system, when you look at the kind of maths of the adjunction, is fascinating because it essentially... Um, describes this whole story of recursion and how we can refer to the sort of uh, dynamic sequence of what happens in a dynamical system um, in terms of kind of arrows from this dynamical system where we just have natural numbers and we can kind of count up. So there's a very interesting kind of connection between this dynamical system and arrows from it um, into another dynamical system because these sort of arrows in the category of dynamical systems basically correspond to trajectories in the target dynamical system and this kind of story of recursion is really kind of told to us naturally by thinking about how this is the adjoint functor of this even more fascinating in fact much more fascinating I think is this Kofri or chaotic functor. So what this does, it takes a set, so say something like A, B, so you know, some little set, and it makes a dynamical system out of it. But the dynamical system it makes is, in a sense, 
the most complicated or chaotic dynamical system it could possibly make given this information. Um, it's really interesting. So the dynamical system we get, it states our sequences of elements. And the, so we have all the possible sequences we can make out of A's and B's. Each of those is a state of this dynamical system that we get. Um, so if this is Q, then this will be five star of Q. And what's the update function do? Well, it does a left shift. So it sends this sequence here to the thing we get by knocking off the left, the left element and shifting this infinite sequence once to the left. Okay, so if you think about it, like what's one of the most complicated dynamical, discrete dynamical systems you can think about, it has um, its states are just these kind of infinite strings of symbols or words. And then the update is just sort of um, shifting such a sequence once to the left. So for example, um, we could model a trajectory like this. We could say, well, maybe this represents A, B, A, B, dot, dot, dot on forever. We could call that A, B to the power of infinity. And this represents B, A, B, A, dot, dot, dot forever. We could call that B, A to the power of infinity. And doing a left shift on this gives us this and so on. But these are just two different states in this dynamical system here. Um, five star of Q. And there's an infinite number of these different states. It's really very interesting, okay? So this video is already getting pretty long and I already have a lot of pictures and things about these different functors. So what I've decided to do is for 10 minutes or so, uh, rather than talking in front of a blackboard, I'm going to uh, go through some notes on my computer and very briefly talk about these very interesting subjects. Um, this subject matter is taken, a lot of it, from this brilliant book, Conceptual Mathematics by William Levere and Stephen Chanel. Um, not quite sure how to pronounce that, but anyway, um, this is one of the best books on category theory that I've come across. And um, this kind of theory is all explained very, very nicely in the appendix. Um, and I'll put some more kind of notes below uh, so you can find out more information about this topic. But I'm just going to give a kind of rough and ready um, overview of this and show some pictures and so on. So I apologise if it's not um, to the same kind of quality and clarity as most of my stuff, but it's just um, a sort of 10 minute window into this really interesting kind of realm. And, um, you know, I'll get back to using the blackboard and things in, in due time. Okay then, so I want to explain about these adjunctions to do with dynamical systems. Now, I'm doing this on my computer using some notes. So um, I hope this doesn't seem too cryptic. I'm gonna try and explain uh, the different things that are going on here. So the first thing I should say is that psi here, so the first thing I should say is about this picture at the bottom right. So at the very far right, what we have is a arrow in the category of sets. Okay, so we have this set of two elements called X, and we have this other set of one element called Psi of Y. And so here's an arrow in the category of sets, and here's an arrow in the category of dynamical systems. Now I'm drawing these arrows side by side to show that these arrows are sort of in equivalence with each other, because one of the ways we can define adjunctions is to so because one of the ways we can discuss adjunctions is via this kind of homset method which basically is telling us that when psi exclamation mark 
is the left adjoint to the front tool psi, we're going to have that an arrow from psi exclamation mark x to y is equivalent to an arrow from x to psi of y. Now, the next thing I should say is what psi and psi exclamation mark are. Okay, so psi is the so-called points functor, and that goes from the category of dynamical systems to the category of sets. And all it does is it sends a dynamical system to its set of points. What are its points? Well, its points are just these self loops, okay? Because uh, in general, in a category, a point of an object is defined to be an arrow into that object from the terminal object. Now, in the category of dynamical systems, the terminal object is just a dynamical system with a single kind of fixed point, just kind of self loop, if you like. Um, and so the points of a dynamical system basically correspond to the set of fixed points in that dynamical system. Now this functor psi takes a dynamical system and it just gives us the set of points, the set of fixed points, okay? Um, so what I'm trying to illustrate with this picture here is that the left adjoint of this points functor is is this functor here, uh, psi exclamation mark. This is the so-called discrete functor. What this does is it operates, so this psi exclamation mark here, this discrete functor, this is a functor which goes from the category of sets to the category of dynamical systems. So when we do this psi exclamation mark functor on a set, we get a dynamical system. Which dynamical system do we get? We get the dynamical system where we just take all of the, each of the elements of the set and change it into a fixed point of a dynamical system just by adding a sort of loop or defining an update function which sends every element in that set to itself, okay? And I'm trying to illustrate with this picture here that a function um, from x to psi of y um, is equivalent to a kind of arrow from this dynamical system here, psi exclamation mark of x to y. And you see the way that this kind of equivalent function on the left works. It basically maps the fixed points. Um, it basically maps the fixed points uh, just like uh, this function on, so you see the way this arrow between dynamical systems works, it basically just maps the fixed points, um, just like this function on the right here maps the elements, okay? Um, so that's one thing. The next thing is about this functor here, psi exclamation mark exclamation mark, uh, which is a very interesting functor. So what this does is it takes a dynamical system uh, like this one here and it gives us the set of connected components of that dynamical system, okay? So we say that a pair of elements in a, in a dynamical system are connected when you can do a certain number of updates starting from the first element uh, and you can do another number of updates starting from the second element and you end up at the same place, okay? So clearly these two elements here are connected in this dynamical system and this dynamical system has these two different connected components. Now what happens when we do psi exclamation mark on this dynamical system? We just get this set here with these two elements which represents the... connected components of this dynamical system. This element here representing this connected component and this one here representing this connected component. And 
what I'm trying to illustrate with this picture here is that this connected components functor here is actually the left adjoint to this discrete functor here. Because what we're doing here to get psi exclamation mark, because what we're doing here to get psi exclamation mark y is we're taking this set y and we're doing the discrete functor upon it. So we're just replacing each of these elements in this set y with a fixed point and making a dynamical system like that. And I'm trying to illustrate with this picture that this arrow here from, I'm trying to illustrate with this picture that these kind of functions like this from psi exclamation mark exclamation mark x, the set of connected components of x, I'm trying to say that this function here from this to this set of three elements is sort of equivalent to this is sort of equivalent to this kind of arrow here uh, of dynamical systems which is sending this dynamical system x to this kind of discrete dynamical system uh, because essentially what we're doing here is representing um, the connected components of this dynamical system as sort of so because what we're doing here is representing the connected components of this dynamical system um, by the way that we're sending them into these different discrete points, uh, these different fixed points of psi exclamation mark y. Okay, so um, just like this element here gets sent to this element here, so this connected component here gets sent to this discrete point here. So um, we can kind of think of classifying the connected components of a dynamical system um, by thinking of it as a kind of arrow to a discrete dynamical system which is involving a set of connected components. Okay, so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that this points functor psi which sends a dynamical system to its set of fixed points um, is actually the right adjoint to this functor psi exclamation mark. Um, this is the so-called discrete functor. It takes a set and it makes a very simple dynamical system out of it just by replacing each of the elements in this set with a self loop. Okay. Um, now, what I'm basically doing here, so what I'm basically trying to do here is represent that the, so what I'm basically trying to do here is represent that when we have a dynamical system X, if we do the kind of points functor on it, um, and we also get this arrow epsilon X, then that's going to be a terminal morphism. Then that's going to be a terminal morphism from this discrete functor to X. Okay. And this is sort of one way we can represent this kind of a junction. Another one is to think about the kind of correspondence of arrows which comes about because of this adjunction. This is the kind of homset based view of the adjunction. So we can look at a picture representing that. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is a very interesting pair of adjoint functors which go between the category of dynamical systems and the category set. OK, so in particular, if you get a dynamical system, then you can always do a forgetful functor on it. Um, so you can just sort of take the dynamical system and then forget about the arrows and that just gives you a set. So that gives us this forgetful functor, which I'm just calling phi. Now, the interesting thing is if you take the adjoints to that functor. So in particular, if you take the left adjoint, you get the so-called free functor. Now, the way this works on a set is it makes that set into a dynamical system. And it's a very interesting dynamical system. Um, what we essentially do is take that set and take the Cartesian product of it with the set of natural numbers. 
and then we get a dynamical system where um for example if this was element a um then we'd have this dynamical system which has a of zero a of one a of two dot 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 and then we just have an update function just sends a of n to a of n plus one so it essentially it evolves in time but all it does is just um sort of how it all it does is it just has these kind of states which are just labeled with elements of our original set uh, and these states also have a kind of counting number associated with them and when we update we just uh, add one to the second component of the name of the state we just sort of um increment on this counter okay um so we essentially get this dynamical system which um sort of has a load of these kind of counting dynamical systems one for every element so we can just think of it as a kind of um load of lines of arrows going down one line for every element of our original set the interesting thing is that this kind of free functor that changes the set into a dynamical system like this is actually the left adjoint to our forgetful functor and if we see how this actually works how we actually do this if we actually get a dynamical system a and then we compute a terminal morphism from this free functor to a um we actually get this interesting dynamical system here psi exclamation mark psi of a and it turns out that this co-unit here this arrow from this into a actually is basically um telling us the whole story about how dynamical systems are related to recursion and defined in terms of kind of how we can think of trajectories in the dynamical system um, as sort of um, injecting one of these kind of ladders of arrows into it because um, the kind of the kind of because the kind of arrow from this dynamical system here to a this epsilon a here um, is kind of sending this counting trajectory here into the trajectory of stuff that goes on in our dynamical system when we start at the corresponding left point and so on. Um, so I'll just sort of show you this picture and if you um, look at the Yonida lemma video about what I say in dynamical systems there about how they correspond, how the sort of elements of the dynamical system correspond to um, arrows into that dynamical system from the natural numbers with this counting thing um, you'll see that there's a very sort of beautiful relationship between that and the way that this co-unit is defined here but i think what's far more fascinating is actually the right adjoint to this functor phi. So remember the way this functor phi works, it's a forgetful functor, so it takes a dynamical system A and it just gives us the set of elements from that dynamical system, forgetting about the update system. Um, but the way that this co-free or chaotic uh, kind of functor five star works is just absolutely fascinating um it really seems as though um there's a kind of creativity in category theory that you know by some of these functors which naturally naturally appear from adjunctions um we really get the kind of essence of making something as complicated as possible um so what do i mean well how does this functor phi star work on a particular set i mean it sends a set to a dynamical system that's what this co-free functor does so what kind of dynamical system does it send um this set well okay let's talk about this one this set a and b to well the dynamical system actually has 
well it has elements and it has an update function what are the elements well the elements are actually infinite strings or infinite lists what are those lists made out of a's and b's okay so think about all the kind of infinite sequences of a's and b's that we have um, in other words think about the functions from the natural numbers into a set like this these basically correspond to sequences of a's and b's now each such sequence is an element in this dynamical system phi star of k and what's the update function well it's just the left shift okay so for example if we have a sequence a b a b a b a b uh, in this phi star of k um, that will get updated to become a sequence b a b a b a and so on so if we just take a sequence and then knock off the left element and shift everything else one step to the left um, that will be the kind of updated version of um, of an element under this dynamical system so this is this fascinating dynamical system which has um, which has this immense number of states and really extremely kind of chaotic behavior um, now the actual way that this adjunction works is also very interesting so um, if we take um, this dynamical system a here then what we want to do is then what we want to do is determine an initial morphism um, from a to phi star okay um, so what that corresponds to is this kind of phi of a that we get by applying this forgetful functor to a um, together with this unit arrow eta of a um, which goes which goes from a to phi star of phi of a and the way that this and the way that this component of the unit actually works is very interesting it it sends a element of our dynamical system it sends an element of our dynamical system to the kind of sequence of the states which we're going to encounter by evolving this dynamical system over the future so for example what can we expect if we start off at one and evolve this dynamical system well the sequence of states we're going to encounter is one two three two three two three two three it's this it's one and then this infinitely repeating sequence of twos and threes okay similarly this unit here sends two to two three two three two three this sequence here and we can see how um, updating this dynamical system corresponds to doing a left shift of this okay um, so all of this these things I've been talking about okay so these sort of fascinating functors which I've been talking about these adjoints occurring in dynamical systems remember that dynamical systems that category of dynamic remember that dynamical systems are just functors from this kind of additive monoid of natural numbers to set okay so there'd be many other kinds of functors from a category to set and they'll correspond to different kinds of structured sets and there's analogous kind of adjunctions which hold in general which really leaves a an amazingly large kind of landscape uh, to explore and there are particular functors um, which are associated to things like forgetful functors like these things are which um, are often very well worth exploring so in general if you have um, 
a category of functors from C to set, then you could pick one of the objects of that category. And then there's going to be a kind of forgetful functor associated with that. And what that's going to do is it's going to send these functors to sets um, in such a way that, you know, if you pick, say, object X from your category C, then it's going to send um, a functor F to the set F of X. OK, you can define a forgetful functor like that. In this case, with dynamical systems, um, our kind of category that we're doing, um, our kind of category that we're kind of making functors from just has one object. So there's actually just one kind of forgetful functor in this case. But if you were dealing with, say, graphs, there would be two. One that there'd be a forgetful functor that sends a graph to its set of edges and there'll be a forgetful functor that sends a graph to its set of vertices and um, you can always grab a forgetful functor like that um, for one of these kind of categories of functors into sets and then you can ask well what's its left adjoint what's the kind of free functor associated with that uh, and you'll get something interesting as we've got here and you can also ask, what's the co-free functor associated with that thing? Um, now, I'm not sure if such um, left and right adjoints are guaranteed to exist in general, but they certainly do exist in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, when you get these things, it's really quite fascinating. Um, the other thing you can do... So I mean basically what I was trying to say so basically what I've so basically what I was trying to say is that once you get one of these forgetful functors, you can kind of get on this sequence of adjoint functors, you can explore, you know, left adjoints and right adjoints and find these really kind of fundamental uh functors that'll tell you a lot about the kind of category of structured sets that you're studying. Um the other thing you can do, these are all kind of suggestions of William Levere, who's an absolutely profoundly good category theorist. And his other suggestion is that if you get a discrete functor, then it's very profitable to explore the left and right adjoints of that. OK, so. So what you can do um, in general um if you're interested in uh funk so what you can do in general if you've got one of these categories of functors from c to the category set is you can send all of the so in general what you can do you can always make a kind of discrete functor um so in general, if you're interested in some category of functors from C to set, then you can always make a kind of discrete functor. And, and the way that that works is it sends a set to one of these functors, one of these kind of structured sets, one of these functors from C to set. Uh, which functor does it get? Which functor do you get? Well, you get the functor which sends every object of C to that particular set that you're interested in and every arrow of C to the identity arrow um, associated with that set. And that's the kind of discrete functor which we're working with here. And we saw how it's related to things like connected components and so on. So again, this is a kind of functor you can get for a general functor category and um, then you can think about what adjoints it has and learn lots about the category in question.